we're going to hear are a little different from the earlier presentations. The presentation we're going to hear now is from a team that went and did some work in Bangladesh with Keller Keller International on urban agriculture. Now, when they first proposed this scheme to me, I was, to put it politely, a little skeptical. And the team has labored hard and reasonably successfully to convince me of the importance of urban agriculture as a very interesting development approach. And I hope you will feel the same after the presentation. Dr. Gia, I believe those are the kindest words you've ever had in the past three years. That's great. Thank you. Recently, the headlines say it all. World food crisis turns rice into gold. Asian food crisis has political and civil implications. New economics of hunger. Food crisis eclipsing climate change. And global food crisis, the new silent tsunami. Indeed, 2008 has been called the year of the food crisis. In reality, over 800 million people go to bed hungry at night. And it's estimated that 100 million people may have been pushed into poverty as a result of high food prices in the last two years. Our client, Helen Keller International, is working to change this scenario in Bangladesh. Good afternoon, my name is Crystal Sermon. My capstone teammates are Fernanda Sosa, Cynthia Burning, and Bradley Cohea. Um, uh, our capstone project is entitled Homestead Food Production in Barisol, Bangladesh. Uh, first, we're going to introduce our client, Helen Keller International, and their Homestead Food Production Program. Um, then we're going to discuss the two components of our research um, and the methodologies and conclusions of each. Our client was Helen Keller International, um, and they've been in Bangladesh since 1978. Their mission is to combat, treat, and prevent blindness and malnutrition, um, which is among the highest in the world in rural Bangladesh. Helen Keller has been implementing its Homestead Food Production Program in ba uh, Bangladesh since 1989 and in Barisal Division since October of 2005. Um, the purpose of the program is to improve the nutrition of the rural poor through increasing their vitamin A intake and also to increase the household income through the selling of surplus uh, produce. The program is comprised of two projects. The first is um, a Homestead Gardening Project whose participants are women with at least one child under the age of two. Um, Helen Keller trains the women in horticulture and poultry rearing and assists them in setting up their gardens. HKA also sets up and trains one village model farm per village, uh, which is a farm that demonstrates model homestead interventions and enables the program participants to observe and learn about new agricultural ideas and technologies. And lastly, the Homestead Gardening Project has a marketing group system which enables the women to sell their surplus produce. <coughs> the second element of the Homestead Food Production Program is a goat rearing project um, whose participants are ultra poor women. Um, these are typically widows and the elderly and they have little or no income. And the women receive one vaccinated female goat um, which they can breed and generate income from selling the offspring. There are two components to our research. The first uh, was to create cost-benefit analysis, analysis models in order to assess the net economic benefit of the home, Homestead Food Production Program at the household level um, in an effort to illustrate how the levels of HKS investments relate to changes in the livelihoods and income generation of its participants. And the second component was to develop an urban Homestead Food Production Program strategy um, in which we for which we identified the needs, opportunities, constraints, and feasibility of an urban um, HFPP intervention. First, we're going to discuss the cost-benefit analysis models in detail, um, take you through our methodologies and findings and conclusions, and then we're going to discuss the urban strategy. Um, HKI's motivation for creating a cost-benefit analysis model was that they have been collecting data on the health and nutritional impact um, of the HFPB since 1990, but they have never um, collected any data on the program's economic impact. And in fact, they don't even have the necessary tools to co conduct the necessary assessment. Um, so they wanted models that what they would be, 
that they could use to conduct cost-benefit analyses um, of their HFPPs, not only in Barisol, but throughout Bangladesh and even in other countries where this program is being implemented. So our research question was what is the cost and benefit information necessary and sufficient to complete a cost-benefit analysis model of the Homestead Food Production Program in Barisol? We conducted our research in four villages in Ramat Khor Union of Bagu Ganj Subdistrict and Barisol Division. Um, in four days, we completed 40 surveys, all of which were conducted in Bengali and then translated into English. And we surveyed 30 um, homestead gardening participants and 10 goat rearing participants. We also performed direct observation of the village model farms, the homestead gardens, and one local market um, where we conducted a pricing exercise of uh, vegetables, poultry, eggs, and goats. And lastly, we conducted interviews with Helen Keller International Staff and one of their partner organizations in order to learn more about the Homestead Food Production Program. And now Cynthia is going to discuss the cost-benefit analysis models in more detail. Okay. So the general concept of a cost-benefit analysis is quite simple. You track the costs of a project, compare them to the benefits over a certain amount of time, and calculate an economic rate of return, or ERR, we chose a 10-year time horizon. The, these are the costs and the benefits we included in our model. The HKI costs came from the detailed project budget, the participant costs came from our interviews in the field, and the benefits came from a combination of our interviews, a market pricing exercise, and a mathematical calculation of a goat herd growth model. Um, we're going to illustrate for you the growth of a goat herd. If uh, Helen Keller gives one goat here in year two, you can see how the herd grows throughout the years. Uh, once you get to years six, seven, eight, nine, ten, we've reached the uh, the maximum ideal herd size for one ultra poor woman, and so uh, the herd stabilizes. So we created these models so that they would be extremely easy to use for people who have no training in economics whatsoever. Both models, both the goat herd model and the, the gardening model, are built around a list of assumptions. Uh, you can see our assumptions are highlighted in yellow here. And all you have to do is change any of the assumptions, and the model will recalculate the benefit streams and the rate of return. So in this way, Helen Keller will be able to, to use this model to determine how external factors, such as changes in market prices, will affect these benefit streams and rate of return. I'm going to walk you through a very simple sensitivity analysis that will show you how if you change one or two of the, the assumptions, um, the economic rate of return changes. So this is our, a graph of our net benefits for the gardening project. Uh, you can see there's a very steep learning curve in the first few years and then it levels off once the garden is pretty well established. And this is what happens if you change the market price of chickens, ducks, and eggs. Um, this could occur if, for example, a bird flu became a really big problem in Bangladesh and the, the demand for poultry and poultry products decreases. You can see there's a pretty substantial decrease in the net benefits and in the ERR. And so this shows that the model is very sensitive to market prices. Uh, we can do the same thing with our go rearing project. Here's the, the returns over 10 years. And this is what happens if you increase the price of goat feed by 50%. So with, as uh, the price of grain rises throughout the world, this is a very plausible outcome. You can see the benefits decrease quite substantially here too. So even though we can't use these models to, to conclude anything about all of the participants in Bangladesh, the data we collected is useful in that it shows us how the models work, it shows us which parameters the, mo the models are most sensitive to. It also allows us to conclude that the rates of return for both projects are extremely high. Speaking of our high ERRs, uh, you've probably noticed that um, they are much higher than, for example, World Bank or Millennium Challenge Corporation projects, which fall generally between 10 and 30 percent. Um, there are a couple of reasons for this. We conducted a literature review of small-scale uh, homestead gardening projects around the world and found that they all show very high returns. Um, that the smaller the piece of land, the higher the return per hectare. So uh, that's our research is in line with that. And um, secondly, 
Our surveys revealed a universal lack of record keeping. So not a single one of our survey respondents had any kind of records about how many tomatoes they were producing, how many vegetables at all they were producing. So they're very rough estimates. Um, it's possible they were overestimating. It's also equally possible they were underestimating. Um, and so one of our major recommendations for HKI is that they incorporate an element of record keeping into their training for both of these projects so that uh, as future data is collected, we can be sure that this data is much more reliable. So finally, HKI will be able to use these models to prove to donors that their projects are not only cost effective, but they're also having a very significant impact on the lives and livelihoods of the 22,000 direct beneficiaries. So now we will discuss the urban part of our project. Okay, the second component of our research was to explore urban slums and peri-urban communities in Brazil City in order to identify or to determine if it was possible to implement a homestead food production project in these areas. There are two motivating factors behind this research. First is rapid urbanization occurring throughout the world today caused by urban, like rural urban migration. Uh, this urbanization is causing uh, poor access to food supply because of lack of availability and also low purchasing power of many of the uh, urban slum dwellers. Bangladesh is not an exception for rapid urbanization. In fact, this country is already facing several challenges in feeding its urban population. Brazil City, uh, the focus of our research, has several nutrition problems according to the Nutritional Super Surveillance Report published by HKI. The poor population of this area uh, have problems meeting their nutrition needs, mostly because of low consumption of vegetables. Other examples of, of this poor nutrition in the area are uh, a higher proportion of malnourished children in relation to the rest of the country, as well as an estimate of one uh, third of pregnant women being chronically, def uh, chronically energy deficient. So these are the reasons that uh, concern HKI and its donors about feeding urban poor populations and why they are exploring implementing projects in this areas of the of the Barisal division. The implementing a homestead food production project in Barisal City would imply doing urban urban agricultural practices because urban agriculture is defined as establishing agricultural activities in urban or city-like settings. This is the definition used by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So, of course, HKI's interest is to uh, reach the poorest populations, and that is the reason why they asked us to focus on poor urban, peri-urban communities and urban slums. In order to select our target locations, we use the following definitions for these. A urban slum is a, is a settlement of, of 10 or more households that meet four of the five following criteria. Predominantly poor housing, very high population density, poor environmental services, especially water and sanitation, low socioeconomic status, and lack of security tenure. Peri-urban communities are generally defined as sites where agricultural and urban activities are juxtaposed. In the case of Barisal City, we also include the criteria used by the Barisal City Corporation, which is that peri-urban communities are those located more than 20 kilometers outside of the city, but still within uh, city boundaries. During our research, we found that peri-urban communities had uh, many of the same characteristics as urban slums. Now, what we did in the field, we wanted to answer the question if HKI could increase the livelihoods of urban dwellers by implementing homestead food production projects in the city? And if so, what modifications would be needed in order to uh, fit the project to the, the circumstances of the urban settings? So in order to do this, we in four days, we visited 12 of the 351 urban slums in Barisal City. These 351 were identified by the, res the Urban Research Center of Bangladesh. In this map, you can see the distribution of slums <coughs> in, the, in the 30 wards that compose uh, the Marisol city. 
One interesting fact that we found out about urban slums uh, was that 94% of them receive, have the intervention of at least one NGO. And this information was consistent with what we found when we went in the field. In each of the communities visited, we carried out a survey uh, that intended to collect more information about population size, water and sanitation services, what in interventions of other NGOs, land tenure, and trainings that these communities might have had regarding nutrition, uh, horticultural, poultry, and gender-related issues. While in the communities, the team also recorded observations about housing characteristics, uh, spacing between the houses, availability of open land, general environmental conditions, and uh, gardening practices that might have been taking place in the community. These observations were very important for us to contextualize the information we had previously gathered through key informant interviews with NGOs such as UNDP and Concern International who have extensive experience in the field as well as with government officials from the Department of Livestock Security, no, the Department of Livestock the Department of Agricultural Extension and the Barisol City Corporation, which share with us uh, some of the knowledge they have about working in urban areas. So now Brad is going to explain to you some of our findings and conclusions. Our investigations revealed several key challenges and opportunities for an urban homestead food production project. From our interviews that we carried out, with local officials and urban residents, we identified the following three challenges. First, water and sanitation conditions are very poor, which pose a threat for safe horticulture and animal rearing, particularly in urban slums. While there was a significant variation among the communities, there tends to be a lack of open spaces for cultivation, especially in the urban slums. And third, another challenge for an urban intervention is the perception of urban cultivation. We found that urban cultivation, I'm sorry, we found that urban agriculture activities were perceived as having only a marginal importance by local officials and were not considered to be an income generating activity among the households. In terms of opportunities, the capstone team identified the following four areas. While some of the residents raised the issues of the threats of eviction, particularly on private lands, there are actually few cases of evictions in body shop. This means that the HFPP could be a low-risk investment for many communities. Second, in almost all the communities visited, indigenous agricultural knowledge was present in some form. As you can see here, we have potted plants, and down there we have a, a netting that they were using to offer shade as well as to, to grow uh, vegetables. In this sense, HKI can build on existing practices to implement a more systematic approach to urban cultivation. Third, a demand exists for nutritional education in all the communities that we visited. As a comparative advantage for HKI, this is an opportunity not only to improve the nutritional status, I'm sorry, this nutritional status of its inhabitants, but also to educate and motivate people to shift from more traditional, improved, to develop, I'm sorry, to shift from traditional to improved to develop gardens. And lastly, while agricultural production may not be large enough, at least initially, to generate significant increases in income. Vegetable production and animal rearing can supplement income and increase food security. Given the aforementioned key challenges and opportunities, the Capstone team concluded that an HFPP intervention in slum and peri-urban communities in Body Shell would be feasible. As a deliverable, the Capstone created two two-year strategies for urban slum communities and peri-urban communities in Body Shell. The strategy is built around the following four key recommendations. First, we need to acknowledge the significant variation in available space, structure, and housing conditions in slums and peri-urban communities. For this reason, the HFPP model must be modified accordingly. This means the HFPP model will need few modifications in peri-urban environments. While in slum communities, HKI will need to replace village model farms with community gardens and introduce new innovative methods for food production, such as container, netting, and rooftop gardening, among others, while making full advantage, taking full advantage of existing indigenous knowledge. 
Second, we recommend that HKI include environmental awareness along with its nutritional education, as urban cultivation may not be very sustainable if steps aren't taken to introduce recycling systems and create environmental awareness among the ag agriculturalists. Also, water and sanitation seem to be re requisites for an HFPP intervention in urban areas. To this end, we recommend that HKI develop interventions with existing organizations in order to offer bundled, a bundled package with water and sanitation. And finally, we recommend that HKI carry out additional research to select locations and beneficiaries. We suggest this be performed through data collection and baseline surveys in the following areas. Income and employment, space availability, food security, and water and sanitation conditions, among others. On a final note, with the price of food, excuse me. On a final note, with the price of food skyrocketing around the world, the desperately poor and overpopulated Bangladesh suffers tremendously. For example, the price of rice, the core of the Bangladeshi diet, has jumped nearly 30 percent. This is a major problem in a country where nearly half the population live on less than a dollar a day. With the highest population density in the world, Bangladesh continues desperately to search for solutions to food insecurity. Homestead food production, while not the panacea for the nation's challenges, holds the promise of alleviating the stresses associated with this complex problem of meeting the demand for food at the local level, particularly among the poor and ultra-poor of Bangladesh. Thank you.